So welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Montserrat bombay Rosic, and I want to begin by acknowledging that the Harbor Graduate School of Design is located on the traditional and ancestral land of the Massachusetts, the original inhabitants in what is now called Boston and Cambridge. We pay respect to the people of the Massachusetts tribe, past, present, and future, and honor the land itself, which remains sacred to the Massachusetts tribe. Tonight's lecture is part of the inaugural Arts Thursday program, a university-wide initiative sponsored by the Harvard University Committee on the Arts. The Arts Thursday initiative promotes access to the arts among the Harvard community and beyond, inviting audiences to attend and participate in arts focus events every Thursday evening. This particular lecture is supported by the Rose Visiting Artists Fund. This weekend, also, we have other uh, events that we would like you to invite you. Um, please join us for Front Door, a series of happenings centered on the recognition, reconciliation, and affirmation of Isamu Noguchi's and Finnish Avon Cenotaph. Initially proposed in 1952, the Hiroshima Peace Park, designed by Kenzo Tanji, a series of events will take place tonight Friday and on Saturday. And more information is available in our GSD programs. Our speaker tonight also is a contributor to one of our other cultural initiatives, that is the Harbor Design Press. And the publication Empty Plinths, Monuments, Memorials, and Public Sculpture in Mexico will be released in early 2024. The book conveys a diverse collective of voices around the future of one of the most continuous public monuments in North America, Mexico City's monument to Cristóbal Colón uh, in Avenida de la Reforma. Okay, so now um, I will start um, with today's um, Spring Rose Visiting Artist Lecture that I have the pleasure to introduce one of the most internationally known contemporary Mexican artists, Abraham Cruz Villegas. He was born in Colonia Jusco, in Lomas de Coyacán, a southern neighborhood in Mexico City, where the city becomes less regulated, more informal, and mixes with its chaotic geology, the Pedregal, a landscape formed out of basalt and solidified lava flows, which support one of the richest ecosystems in Mexico. Abraham links his work back to this place where he's familiar with the build and the natural environments. In his work, he has interpreted this life experience to expand the concept of autoconstrucción that can be translated as self-construction or do-it-yourself. Autoconstrucción is a kind of way of life in Mexico, extremely common and a traditional building technique, even of the middle class, where families build their unfinished houses. In other words, families build their homes through time. The construction are full of invention, creativity, and community cooperation. Most of his work over the past 30 years builds upon this idea of autoconstruction. On top of the special and material implication of this technique that we see in many of his sculptures and installations, Abraham also sees the depiction of hope, the hope that is put on these rivers on top of all the constructions waiting for the next extension to come. This same hope for growth has also informed several pieces where he works with soil, seeds, and vegetation. One of the most recognized is his installation at the, at the Tate Modern Turbine Hall in London in 2015, where he, locate, where he collected, potted, and irrigated soil from around London. And once in the main room, the, the, the visitors could watch the plants grow during the expand of the exhibition. We see how Abraham's idea of autoconstruction becomes a methodology for more than building a home. It becomes an artistic practice, a way of life, and a form of thinking. Let me now talk about the relevance of his work for us as designers. I will do so by showing you this tool, a Leatherman. For those not familiar with this, uh, it's a foldable tool, and you can cut and saw and measure and bend and haul and cream and offer various types of beverages. So this pocket tool is relevant because Abraham is asked, uh, was asked uh, about a favorite object 
and he said he liked tools. And he says, I like all the tools, and in particular, I like this one. So, in fact, it's not difficult to understand. A Leatherman is a foldable wall of, possible, of possibilities to work with materials to assemble and reassemble the wall. Always ready, always with you. As you know, our wall will require to be ready for, with all these tools and more. To get reassembled, as the uncertainty of the years to come, we'll need our full imagination, cooperation, and construction of new assemblages. For me, his work is deeply inspiring. It's a deeply inspiring way of thinking about the world as an unfinished project, a collective project that emerges at the intersection of many voices, many hands, and even more hopes. With this, I will conclude by borrowing a word from Claude Lévi-Strauss, bricoleur, a true craftsman who deals with projects in, a, in entirety, taking into account the availability of materials and creating new tools. I think this perfectly suits our guest. Please help me welcome Abraham Cruz Villegas, a tireless bricoleur. Well, thank you. Good night. Thank you, Tat. Uh, well, first of all, uh, that's true. It's one of my favorite objects. And uh, I don't know why they, they took it from, from my pocket uh, three times at least when trying to get in a plane. And I don't know how they arrived to know I wanted to dismantle the device. But anyways, I still have one at hand all the time as possible. Well, first of all, I want to say that I'm very proud to be here. It feels like home for me being here in Harvard. Um, I'm very proud to speak here at the Harvard Uni University Graduate School of Design. I want to thank Paige Johnston, Ken Stewart, Kat Chavez, Tina O'Brien, Matthew Smith, and Kat, of course, uh, who maybe knows more than Mexico than me, and um, Haru Heshiki in Mexico, who works with me, Alejandra, Ana, and Damien. And when I say that it feels home, it's because some years ago in 2016, um, Harvard University Press published my, my, my selected writing, edited by Dr. Robin Greeley, who's here, in a collection coordinated by Dr. Jose Falconi, who's also here. Thank you very much for this. I'm also very proud of that publication. In that, in that book, um, Robin, who's been some, someone who I've been speaking a lot with, I mean, now it's many years, we constructed friendship through, through speaking and through learning, me mostly making questions, and she making questions and on learning from me. And, uh, but she says something very interesting that she describes my work as a sculptor as a dynamic contingency. And this is something I've been, sti I still think about, like the way of how do I appropriate this concept and give a shape in space as art. And I'm, I'm still working on this. In, in her words, my works elaborate precarity or precariousness as a productive tension between collapse and vitality, or vitality, between disorder and systematization, and between pragmatism and imagination, materialized as both a metaphor and a structural mechanism for object experience. Um, she also mentions Dr. Mark Goldfrey, a curator, a professor who I've been working with uh, as, a, as a curator. And he calls my practice structural juxtaposition. And he says it's a dual strategy of juxtaposing unlike elements and subordinating them to structural criteria. But I will not say more about this and about their opinions. Uh, I'll just, I'm just quoting them. I really hope if you are interested you might find the book it's called the logic of disorder and it's published by harvard university press in fact very much i will go the opposite i will try to be i mean i'm again i'm very proud to be here in harvard in a very academic environment and i will try to be as consistent and coherent with my work as an artist with what i'm saying so I will go very contradictory, very inefficient, very delirious, contradictory, unstable, precarious, and stupid. <laughs> and 
starting with that, I will just start not in order, but starting not chronologically, but as messy as I am. These are images from drawings I made. I will speak about recent projects mostly, and uh, maybe things that not even Robin knows. And these are drawings that I give to people who invite me to make exhibitions in museums. And this is kind of the extreme pride of my recent practice. So this is something in which I almost do nothing. And uh, so I just make these doodles on paper, uh, trying to make caricatures of what I think are sculptures. So people in museums or galleries can make them after my drawings with whatever they have at hand that could be dismantled uh, furniture, forgotten things, or pieces of previous exhibitions, like wood, uh, even plaster, or pieces from something that something, I mean, it's something that maybe for some other people does not work anymore. So maybe I have to say that I started as an artist working as a car caricaturist in the mid 80s. So this is, I think, yet very much the way I make my, my work in general, thinking as a caricaturist, but of course it means in a very political way, as caricaturist. So I just send these drawings by email to the museum or the gallery, and they make interpretations of whatever they think, the size they want, the way they, they can, with the materials they choose. Sometimes I propose like beer barrel and dolly which is something all uh, art uh, handlers have in the storage of museums and galleries. They have also sound systems, but I don't, I don't describe that because anyways it will be there. These are like platforms that they have like a, a splints. If you can see, almost all of them, they have the drawing or the representation of holes in their sides. So they can resonate as sound containers or expanders, like uh, the cajon from Peru. Some are inspired like in other furniture that is already existing, like for transporting beer or soft drinks or goods. In fact, they represent nothing. And this is the final way they show in the exhibition. This is in Haus de Kunstzurich in Switzerland in 2019, if I'm not wrong. And then I combine them with other works previously made like that on the wall. Like paper, printed paper. And sometimes I, we add like uh, local plants, as you see. We make some little research and finding native species of plants that they kind of uh, sit on the sculptures the way they can grow, dry, rot, or bloom, or sprout during the exhibition time. But then we organize a series of, uh, also I, sometimes I make drawings of apes the way I make self-portraits, as everything I make is a self-portrait. So most of these large drawings are made with mops or brooms, so they can grow this way. Sometimes the sculptures can be rearranged according to programs we organize with the people of the museum, like this. So visitors can use literally the sculptures or the groups of sculptures as uh, activity devices. As you can see, they are very, very similar to my drawings. People in museums are super professional, and even when my drawings are so stupid, they make them perfectly. This is Nadia Lartigue from Mexico. She's a choreographer. The Lady Blue. The workshop today is about trying to interrupt or make some sort of crack in the, in the flow of how people are visiting uh, Abraham's exhibition. So my work has to do with arrhythmia and how to generate little cracks and things in space that interrupt. So like when a manifestation or a, a political intervention in a city interrupts the city flow. It's a little bit the way I would like to approach this and how to be a rhythmic uh, as a voluntary act.
What I like of this uh, possible project is that many of the times I'm, I become just a visitor. I don't do nothing. And this is organized by my friend Martin Nunez, who is a, a skateboard artist. And uh, he went to Zurich to organize this with local skateboard people. And he organizes like workshops and for people also who do never did skateboard. So these go like uh, community centers. The, there in Zurich, we had these uh, activities, but also like refugee talks about like the way they mimic their, or their, their, their clothes from their homelands in a cold country or so. They invite people to cook. They invite people to organize concerts with local bands and so on botanists to talk about the local species. And so in every different place, it goes different. This is in Austin, Texas. Starting with the same drawings, different sculptures. So we're here in an exhibition by Abraham Cruz Viegas titled, Hi, How Are You, Gonzo? The kinds of work, first of all, range from quite a few wall works. They're very beautiful and freehand, symbolic on a lot of levels, but also very playful. There's also a series of blind self-portraits that consist of the detritus from the artist's life that he then paints over. In addition, uh, the public will be able to experience these set of objects that are meant to be used through activations throughout the course of the exhibition. So this word activation, it suggests something like a performative piece, but it's different because it is meant to invite the public to come and participate in a way that they're typically not able to do in a museum exhibition space. The sculptures, they are invitations to, to do something, to think about how this could be activated in any ways. I think it becomes also a space where transformation is allowed and invited. I thought it was going to be like a lot of art plastered around the wall. We didn't know that our cells are going to be like the exhibit in a sense. That's pretty cool. That was pretty cool. Like I walked in and it immediately felt like play. It was so open and all ages, all colors, all like all everything. It's super freeing. Lo que más me gusta es entender que somos comunidad y que podemos muy bien intercambiar todos nuestros saberes en un espacio en donde a una persona se le ocurrió que confluyera. I think it's been exciting to me to see the community rally around this exhibition. There was a vibrancy around the exhibition opening that was wonderful and felt very inclusive. So I would invite everybody to come experience the exhibition through July 14th at the Contemporary Austin. This is in Aspen, Colorado. This is in Santiago de Chile, in Chile. This is a different thing like I made in Los Angeles at the Regan Projects Gallery a year ago. So I sent the design, the drawing for these platforms, planes that are used for me, myself, becoming a live sculpture to read poetry on them. Sobre monte y llanura se presiente que nimba el sol en su postrero brillo. La voz de un invisible caramillo eglogizando el aire confidente. Ya demudado, trémulo de mente, lleno solo del grito del cuclillo, se hunde el campo en el fiel agua amarillo que emana de las bocas del poniente. Inmóvil actitud, silencio intacto, En la áurea fiebre del minuto acendra la rubia afronta su verdor abstracto y su fino vaivén la escolopendra en los senos del valle estupefacto una divina soledad se engendra. I 
I was reading the poems by Concha Urquiza, who's a Mexican poet from a century ago, from the 20s in Mexico, in Michoacán. This is from a show I made in Paris at uh, Chantal Cruzel Gallery. Uh, it was uh, sculptures that I made only with found objects from the street that I used hanging them on my back using my forehead as a kind of a, how you say, like a, for carrying, I don't know, a word. And then I invited some people to interact with, like a choreographer, Emmanuel Uin, who had a dialogue with me, like mimicking the way she understood I made the works. And then asking me to mimic her as well. So it was kind of an exchange and a, a completely inefficient dialogue. I mean, very productive, but not the way of uh, late capitalism production. I the, forgot the last one. <laughs> the drawings on the wall represent the, the ways or the paths I walked in Paris from favorite places to other favorite places, like the school where I was teaching, the Beaux-Arts de Paris, to the gallery, to my house, to museums, to bars, and then represented as abstractions on paper as monoprints. Well, this, is, this goes more ridiculous, of course. Oh. Sorry, I want to go back. This is from a show I made at Curimansuto Gallery in Mexico City, in which I uh, recycled different objects from different... Por ahí, estoy retomando también, no solamente el material físico, sino también el material simbólico, tradicional, cultural, de toda esta gente con la que he trabajado, que son los músicos, eh, y también con bailarines, con poetas, activando mis esculturas en cada uno de los lugares donde he expuesto en los últimos años, incluyendo ciudades de Estados Unidos como Aspen y Austin, o Rotterdam, o Tokio, o París, o etcétera, etcétera. Entonces, invité de nuevo a una, a un, a una pandilla, vamos a decirlo así, de cómplices, que son este, las personas que van a participar en las activaciones cada dos semanas, los sábados, en la galería, a la una de la tarde. siempre enuncio en mi trabajo la posibilidad de que se transforme desde su montaje, por ejemplo, y también hay una parte, en este caso en particular, de transformación en cuanto a que va a haber una serie de activaciones durante la exposición, en las semanas que esté en la galería, que va a de algún modo cambiar la configuración de las obras a partir de su uso. Por ejemplo, invité a un amigo percusionista para que percuta las esculturas. Él es compositor y sobre todo es percusionista, entonces él, vamos a decir, va a tener la potestad de transformar y modificar las esculturas de acuerdo a la necesidad, que también es un, un, un índice muy importante de mi trabajo en términos de autoconstrucción. Todo se modifica de acuerdo a la necesidad, en términos del de espacio que habitamos. ¿no? La idea también es que eh, cada vez que vaya pasando por la calle 
algún grupo callejero, músicos, músicos callejeros, que los pasen, los inviten a, a, a la sala donde están esas esculturas para que también toquen allí y que sea como algo improvisado, inesperado y, y variado, ¿no? porque hay de todo. Yo creo que en el contexto contemporáneo, eh, referir o aludir al concepto de siembra es muy importante. Yo lo que voy a hacer es tirar maíz en el piso de la galería, semillas de maíz, para ver si retorna. Y creo que de algún modo, y me, me encanta todo lo que ha pasado, además que muchos de los participantes son mis colegas y amigos, o sea, son gente muy querida, este, yo lo veo como un gesto de esperanza, que es posible en, en un contexto de mucha violencia, de mucho caos y de mucha confusión. Siento que todavía es posible algo y ser partícipe me da mucho gusto. Well, I have to say that in general, in my practice, I always privilege the materiality of objects beyond the cultural uh, background, let's say, of everything. And with all these activities that we've been organizing in, as a program for each exhibition, I appeal to the local and different materials, local materials that in this case are also human, that they give a different index to my project in which I'm also, I become another material like myself. At the very beginning, Tat was mentioning about autoconstrucción that comes exactly from the context in which, uh, in, in where I grew up in Mexico City. That is, it means exactly uh, the houses built that the people who inv inhabit them. Uh, also, this comes from the fact that not, the, not many people can afford buying a house or asking an architect to design a, an apartment or a house at once. And then they have to build the, their houses the way my family did, with whatever is uh, at hand, recycling many times materials that are garbage for other people. And this is, these are images from the very, very early uh, neighborhood that it was, of course, not a neighborhood. It was just rocky land in which people found a way to construct their preca precarious houses the way they could, like having as a main material necessity. This, uh, the credit in the picture, in the picture down in the right corner, uh, it says that all these pictures were taken by the police, the secret police, the Dirección Federal de Seguridad at that moment. So it was like uh, something that was uh, people, all of these communities that became communities in the long term, uh, were chasing and evicted many times from these places that were illegally taken, of course. This is kind of the early evolution of those shacks into early houses. And um, with this, I mean, the description of this would be uh, not trying to go against w with what you said, Tat, but I think it, the, the very concept of autoconstrucción is politically and historically, materially, not the same as do it yourself. And even uh, with Levi-Strauss, it's not a bricolage. But and maybe I'm a bricoleur because I, I can make things with my hands with uh, different tools. But I think in, in, in the economies of uh, the North and uh, capitalism, properly speaking, do it yourself and bricolage are a weekend activities for middle class people without good income. So they can invest a little bit of their time in their free time to do things with their hands as an entertaining thing. In this case, autoconstruction goes in a completely different direction in terms of precariousness and necessity. And again, I have to say, as a, it's, a, it's, it's been written and published many times, that the organization of autoconstruction, not only the construction of the houses, but the dignity of the community, fight, fighting against like a corrupted authori authoritarian authorities, uh, was led by women, as almost everywhere in the world in shanty towns in uh, Villa Miseria in Argentina or Bidonville in different places, etc. So what makes everything similar in the world in, in terms of this autoconstrucción or favela in Brazil is the unfair distribution of wealth. So it's political. Here you see the, the police trying to evict uh, some families and so. And this is, again, more evolution. Maybe this is in the 70s where I, when I was like 12 or so. This is more recent, let's say some 20 years ago. 
So in the evolution and in the moment we are living now, of course, these houses are still changing, like my mother's house where she still lives in. They, they are definitely unfinished and permanently uh, like in transformation. That's why I refer to autoconstruction again, not as a metaphor, not as an allegory, but a parallel process as identity. My identity, our identity, I dare to, share, to say, all of us, our identities are in permanent transformation. We change. Everything, everything changes. There are like many, many pieces of rebar, exhibited rebar, as you can see, and in which like aesthetic decisions are not aestheticized, but they come from specific aesthetic needs from people who live in the houses. They don't lack of aesthetics perspectives. And of course, those are political as well. There is another aspect in which you, you can see in all these houses or outside the houses that people like my family also, we, uh, we are hoarders, we accumulate material because it's possible yet to continue constructing or to change the house and to make, maybe make a new room or to make a new door or a new window. So there are piles of rocks, piles of sand, piles of sticks outside the houses and they, they keep changing the way I'm I'm still changing myself. This is a, a work that also Tad mentioned earlier, that is uh, the, the, the sculpture I made for the Turbine Hall at the Tate Modern Gallery in London in 2015, and it's called Empty Lot. This is the way of referring, again, to, to my neighborhood or autoconstruction, but not illustrating it. I'm not trying to... Uh, represent houses or to represent construction methods or techniques. This is more like a, what happens when you have nothing. And in this case, we collected soil from 34 different spots, outdoors places in London, in the city, and we put them in, in planters. We identified each planter and the, the, the source of soil. So we had identified all these 200 and some different uh, soils in planters, only watering them for six months in the winter. We had some light also, and it was standing on scaffolding that uh, made this thing like possible to dismantle easily after the exhibition finished. After some, I mean, this is a, of course at the very beginning, and during the exhibition, people started throwing uh, not only seed bombs, but also garbage, like making a portrait of themselves as well, in the way they see a possible transformation. But ni nature reacted itself in a positive way. So after some weeks, it started sprouting and going green with so many different species that we hired a botanist to identify them. And we learned that uh, we, we got a rose from Buckingham Palace and jokes like this. Of course, we had some marijuana. But of course, most of these species that grew up there were not, are not identified as native from the UK. So it, it goes also political because it talks about imperialism and the trans, trans, uh, transportation of goods from here to there, including people as they were considered at a certain point. Oh yeah, this is the, I don't remember his name, I'm very sorry, but he went very nicely to identify all these species. He took this little plant and threw it to me and it just stick there because it's a kind of a wild uh, thing that of course it travels on, on, on animals fur, you know, like seeds in birds' uh, stomachs and so. This is a project I made in Tokyo in, uh, at the Fondation Hermes uh, in a very funky building made of glass. And I made these constructions hanging from the ceiling made of recycled paper and uh, chopsticks from restaurants in Tokyo, 
mimicking the, the, the shape of a building that is called molecular. It's a Nagakin building, maybe you know about it. Uh, that was kind of an example of a single author uh, trend of architecture and uh, that was invaded by nature. It had lots of uh, water leaks and so, so very, very soon it went green inside the building. So it's modular, it's made like uh, with containers that you can remove and remake again the shape of the building. It's almost abandoned now, but it's uh, in a very gentrified area, so they are trying, they are fighting, literally, architects for destroying it, for constructing super expensive real estate, or people who say, architects who say that it's a, a treasure of architecture and so on. You know, these discussions that are super fun. And there I, uh, we, we grew, we planted these uh, seeds in hanging pots with a, something that is very popular all around the world, this flower or plant called a morning glory. It grows very quickly, and it's very, let's say, invasive. It, it's, um, uh, I, I asked people there in Tokyo, people who were asking, helping me for a very local, emblematic local plant that was not the chrysanthemum, and they told me about this morning glory, but with a different name that I don't remember now in Japan, in Japanese, sorry. And uh, reading a little bit about it, I, I understood that this is a Mesoamerican species from Central America. It's called Ololiuki. And this Ololiuki happens to be the most similar, I mean, the seed, when they make a, an infusion with the seed, you can get the most similar substance to LSD and the, that the Aztecs used for traveling and for healing. And of course, I wanted to go beyond the cultural content of this material as well, but just trying to witness transformation again. So it grew up inside the sculptures, uh, the, way, the same way it grew nature inside the, the actual building. And then, um, of course, it went beautiful and bloomed at a certain point with uh, blue, pink, and purple and white flowers, as you know them, maybe. And. I invited a group of friends from Mexico, uh, a Huasteco music trio. They, they play the huapangos with these three instruments, the violin, the jarana huasteca, that's a little guitar with five strings, and the quinta huapanguera, that is a bass. And so to play uh, traditional music, but with lyrics that I wrote. Lyrics about water um, and about like uh, different species living in water, both in Japan and in Mexico. One is axolotl and the other one is namazu, the catfish that provokes and produces a tsunami. So the lyrics they sung were based on traditional tunes from the Huasteca region. But trying to go microtonal. So they were inside each of the three sculptures playing their instrument with a knife, going microtonal. There was Andres playing the jarana with a sickle, uh, Pollo playing the bass with a machete, and a, what's the other one? A, He was playing the violin with a little uh, uh, kitchen knife. And they were barefoot, which is very important. Three videos screened on a cardboard screens painted white, so you can see the three musicians performing simultaneously. But here we can only have one. This is a more recent work I made in, in France, at the, in a, 
a former tannery in the town of Amiyi, uh, where they constructed this beautiful art center. And they uh, asked me to make something out of nothing. And then uh, we planted again in little planters, hexagonal planters, the same seed, the Ololiuki, the morning glory, but um, using local soil from there, very polluted, very contaminated. Of course, first of all, from the tannery, and then from the rivers running around the tannery, former tannery. And then I was staying in a old, in an old farm with a, a barn with lots of forgotten tools and objects that I used. They allowed me to use them for the work. And I made a, a horizontal sculpture, like making a sort of a clock, let's say, marking every five minutes. And uh, these were sitting, you can see the, the tops for the water underneath the platforms. That's where the tannery water would run through between rivers. And these are the tools making a circle. You know this plant, isn't it? So again, all objects tell their own stories for different purposes in a farm, for hunting moles, for a gardening, for harvesting, for working, for sitting, for having lunch, for receiving friends. And this is an intervention by local French performance musicians. With them, we didn't plan anything at all. They, we just met right after the performance, so it was really beautiful for me to, to see and to witness how my work is in, in transformation again, like how they, the way they appropriated my work to make it them theirs. And then, of course, in, in this case, in a childish way, if you want, I was trying to reverse the way we represent time as uh, normally, I mean, in, in this case, human time is horizontal and nature time is vertical. So that was for me the paradox. And this is just as a final image for my presentation, a little hint for my next project, starting in May 5th in Kurimansuto Gallery in New York, in which I'm working 
to produce two colors, pink and green. Pink from blackberries and green from copper. Thank you very much. Thank you, Abraham. Um, I think, um, I don't know, I have a lot of things in my head to, to kind of organize right now, but I'm, I'm thinking about what do you see, like, you first were working a lot in Mexico, and then you are invited all around the world, and I want to, for you to maybe tell us more about in your approach that you already have um, in Mexico and all that you know and all you say that is political, how do you approach when, for instance, you are invited in Austin, for instance, besides sending these drawings, how do you make that place, you know, to resound into the visitors and how do you think that they will kind of um, understand your, your kind of approach political and, and uh, approach into yeah. the pieces? Well, I think uh, it's, uh, it's something, of course, I, I discussed a lot with Robin again, <laughs> like uh, on my practice. And I think uh, this is a very important thing, in fact, because uh, against, let's say, the universalization of art and culture and so on, like, uh, like trying to flatten the horizon uh, economically or pol politically, my practice goes not naively uh, against or in favor of that, but like trying to think that things can change from within. And in, in, in general, I mean, like, uh, I, I mean, I try to keep a, and more and more, I think, consciously, my roots and my understanding of where I come from in, in terms of the, the culture and the people behind me, like my father and people before my mother as well, of course, and my context as I grew up and keeping it as material that can, as I said, sometimes as a transformative matter. And then, uh, the, again, it's not naive. But I would not say that I'm, I'm trying to belong naively as well to contemporary art world in a in a superficial way, or in a I mean I'm not I cannot produce the same as an artist does in Berlin or in Stockholm or in Tokyo, but I try to approach to the local in a critical way, which means in crisis. This is this is why I think it's it goes beyond that possible universalization of culture and art, and I hope it may may happen this transformation yet, yeah. Thank you. I will open now to the public, or we also have like um, our virtual public, if anyone has a question. Turn it off. Can you hear me? Yeah. Thank you. That was really delightful. Uh, I was struck by one of the things you said. You said that uh, when you were talking about the hoarding, like you tend to hoard when you have this kind of insecurity of not having something in the future. So you think you it's there right now, so you might hold on to it. Uh, so that's one thought. The other thought I have about hoarding is that you might also, you also need the space to hoard so that's a luxury in itself so there's a there's certain like limits to this like how how much can you do in this in the kind of the economic and you know other situation that you're in um yeah i just i wonder if you can like speak to that a little bit more but that was a really nice moment yeah well of course there's a very important thing as well because i mean i'm i never call myself a collector or an accumulator and I mean, usually I, I don't use also the word hoarder, but I am. I mean, I accept it. And the thing is that maybe the way you describe it is very precise. 
in, in different contexts or economical environments, you hoard because of necessity and the possible use of this or that in the future, not thinking what specifically it's for, but just in case. And then, of course, it brings a different uh, context in terms of economies as where to store all these things, as uh, maybe the beetle, you know, it is carrying a big piece of shit all around the world, that's me, you know? And it, the thing is that I, I kind of uh, uh, transform this ball, let's say, in a proper way, uh, uh, in art, and then sometimes it goes back to be a shoe or a piece of wood and then I reuse it in a different way, and then again it comes, like maybe the show you see, the video from the show I made in Mexico City, Siembra, that was a case in which uh, many works were stored in my gallery storage for years, like from shows I made in, in Greece or in, uh, with materials from Morocco or Paris or Mexico, and at a certain point it, 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 it's too much to, to keep, and then they said, we have to give this back to you, and then I, what I did is to make a new artwork. And then they showed it. I mean, so it's kind of a ping pong thing. But of course, it, it, again, I'm, I'm not naive about the economies, of, the economies of galleries and the art market. It can maybe go to a collection, an art collection or a museum. But most of the times it doesn't. So I have to deal with that myself in a parallel economy that is not necessarily the art market. So it's more ingenuity again, I would say. You know, and yeah, like a, I, I don't know why I started accumulating all these uh, uh, boom boxes, you know, like uh, the ghetto blaster, you know, the thing for music that I love. I mean, just because of music, I, I love carrying my music around. And then suddenly I had like 12 of these things. And then what I did, I just made them an artwork. I mean, I, I kind of had to detach myself from the object like uh, trying to remove the fetish thing from the object and then making something independent from me and perhaps be belonging now to a different economy. But at the end, it didn't sell, so I have it back. So <laughs> it's a, I mean, that, that's my life, you know? <laughs> and I, I, it happens to, with everything in my, in my uh, everyday experience. And I'm, I'm happy that I can see and I can witness this I mean, I have this image, I would tell you, that is maybe something famous. It's uh, the portrait of uh, uh, one of the godfathers of a uh, beat culture, the poet. Uh, the poet. I mean, it's a filmmaker portrait, Harry Smith, maybe you heard about him. And he, he was a filmmaker and he was an ethnographer. He was a um, proto-hippie. And um, a, some of these guys, the poets, Allen Ginsberg, took a beautiful portrait of uh, Harry Smith in which Harry is transforming milk into milk. That's me. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm hanging from Harry Smith now, but I mean, with respect and love to his, to his work and to his beautiful mind, I would love to see the way I work this way. I think when sometimes when you see a work of mine in a museum, it's a piece of wood and a basketball with some pieces of hair from years ago, and the shoe, and the uh, grinder, and it's a sculpture. But out of there, it's a, full, it's a shoe, it's a piece of hair, and milk. Yes. Um, thank you, Abraham. It's always nice to see you, to see your work. Uh, it brings you mentioned the the moment of collecting, no? And you were talking about the the, the initial pieces where you would draw uh, a lot of these um, sculptures on paper, send them to the museum, and they will they would build them according to their own interpretation and their own the material they have at hand. And uh, I wonder a little bit uh, what's what is uh, uh, kept. Uh, as as a collect as as, a, as an item, or uh, are these things demolished after a show? Are they kept as an artwork? Are your sketches, uh, for example, when Edwin Worm uh, does his one-minute sculptures? You know, I, 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 I'm not sure, but kind of the instructions or the Solowit instructions. That's that's the 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 piece. So I, I kind of want to understand your relation to these objects that then finally are constructed in the in the gallery space. <laughs> Well, this is, uh, it's related to the previous question because, in fact, 
at certain point, uh, I agreed with my galleries and so to discard many of the sculptures they had in storage. And so they went back, let's say, to they came from, like uh, from recycling material from previous exhibitions to make new ones. And then sometimes at the end we discard, like in Zurich, in Aspen, in Austin, we discarded everything. And then it went back to, I don't know if they kept it, but I mean, the, the, the deal was that, like not to store anymore or to make travel all these big, big pieces of wood, you know, like they're super heavy, expensive insurance and ridiculous things that are parallel to art making or art projects. And then at the end they were destroyed as art pieces. And for the drawings, I, of course I make the drawings in, in the kitchen with uh, uh, cheap paper, so I mean I keep them, but they have no value in the market. Right? I never exhibit them. Yeah, and mostly I send like uh, scans with from my cell phone to the museums. So everything goes kind of immaterial, if you want, like in a way. And then also, um, I mean, as I said at the very beginning, I, I kind of went really proud about like. Uh, not being necessary myself for the exhibition. I mean, I make the drawing, the doodle in at home while I have a little coffee, then I make a picture with the phone, I send it by email, and then they make the exhibition. They arrange a program with local musicians and skateboarding people and, lo and refugees and local, local. And then I don't even need to travel. And this is really beautiful. <laughs> Thanks. No, I um, I very much enjoyed the the talk and maybe wanted to build on that and also Tat's comment at the beginning that um, the the use of the local local versus when you bring things that are Mexican. So the musicians for the Tokyo project were were Mexican. The instruments were Mexican. Whereas um, at other moments you're very focused on saying you know these plants, this soil comes from the local. So when do you make that choice using the, especially with the music? Um, when is it local and when do you choose to go uh, bring in sort of import your ideas of music? Well, yeah, you know I'm. I mean I would say uh, as part. Let's say if I have any kind of belonging. I would say I'm, uh, my father was part of the Purépecha people. My mother is from the Ñañú people. And the Huasteco people, the musicians are Huasteco. I have nothing to do with Huasteco. It's like Maya and Aztec, nothing. And then I would say uh, that's not related to me at all. It's just like an affection for something that is not necessarily because in the case of an object, let's say, I don't choose any object. And much the less if it's rusty or shiny. In my, I don't do that. I, I, at a certain point, I remember here in Harvard, I, I said that if I was kind of related to any spirituality, I would say I'm an animist. So it's the object who chooses my, myself. And then in this case, I think the musicians chose me. I mean, of, of course, it's, uh, they're moving into subject object. And in this case, I think I, I've been working with them because I started writing lyrics and they found me. And then we started playing and then it happens like, we wanted to have a program and I said, why don't we invite them? And it, it happens that we enjoy each other a lot. That's the main and true reason for traveling with them. I need like a, I'm codependent, I think. <laughs> Hi, Abraham. Um, I, I, I don't know if I got this right, but did you mention that you were originally a political cartoonist? Um, and then it, it kind of contrasts a lot with the, the current way that you draw, which is kind of the political cartoonist has to be kind of very explicit. You have to depict particular um, political characters, uh, like the punchline has to be, you know, referring to things that are very tangible in reality. Whereas your, your current work, your, your doodles are left to the interpretation even of the gallery and the museum and so on. Uh, so I wonder, do you see connections between this, this previous life of yourself and then your, your current work? Yes, I, in fact, I think I have uh, some previous lives that are still to come. 
I mean, like, uh, time for me is uh, something confusing. And then, uh, I mean, this is mostly when I talk about like being a caricaturist, something from the future. I'm not trying to be stupid, but like uh, I, I see more and more myself trying to learn how to produce humor without a punchline, you know, and without any explicitness or without any portrait of particular time politician or character, you know. And then I decided to, I'm still trying, I decided to get rid of all these uh, vices from caricature as we understand it. I was educated by a very important cartoon caricaturist artist from Mexico. He still publishes in La Jornada newspaper. His name is El Fisgón. And he was my professor in the 80s. And uh, or, I mean, I was a kid, I was a teenager. And with some of the friends, like maybe you know Damian Ortega, who's also an artist from my generation, we both attended El Fisgón workshops. And uh, we understood at the beginning he was teaching us how to make drawings and who, how to make the portrait of Jimmy Carter, let's say, at that time, you know. And no, he gave us to read Malatesta and Pro Kropotkin and all this <laughs> anarchist literature that was so beautiful because parallel to that he gave us examples of caricature that we never understood as caricature, like Daumier you know, the, the artist from France, or Gross, the expression, German expressionist, and so on. I mean, like, how this could be, or Kurzwitters, you know? Things that changed our perception of how to make art, not only caricature, and to belong to different worlds and times simultaneously. And that's the way I think I'm still a caricaturist, making sculptures in a very political way, I think, I hope. Thank you. Thank you, Aram. Um, I really enjoyed, I'm from Mexico City, and I really enjoy the way you put in context uh, autoconstrucción, um, which uh, made me think about what happens um, if you, I was wondering if you could speak about the dangers of romanticizing, I don't know how to say that, but poverty, misery, precarity, and whether you sometimes feel you're being used by the system or you feel you use the system and to what purpose? I don't know. If you could talk a little bit about that. Well, that's a very good question. In fact, I think uh, I would ask which system? Because there are different systems. And I mean, uh, I'm, I'm not, uh, I don't think I'm that smart, like in terms of using the system. I don't, I don't really believe in that. And I don't think, maybe I idealize a bit the way I grew up, true, possible, mostly the way people got to organize themselves among them to, to, for basic human rights, you know? That's maybe something I idealize yet, but of course there are many other elements that are part of the process yet, now, that we can see. And like all these people, like uh, my mother, just she's a good example and maybe the best I know, that she, she became an activist, just like that. In the long term, in the, I'm, I, I turned 55 years old this year. And so this is the time of hers to become an activist. And she is, and very, very active. And I don't know what would be her life or her identity if not going through that process. So it would be unfair not idealizing that process. But I don't think, on the other hand, that the system is using me, or which system, or which way the system can use me, what for, you know? I, I'm not really producing any kind of propaganda, I think. And as I was describing, maybe discussing caricature or political cartoon or so, uh, I'm, I'm not really trying to produce any pamphlet with my work. But it's material again. The, the same way, like the music from the Huasteco people, is part of the material for each project, or the lyrics I write. It's different types of material. And these materials, I'm trying to have them in a, an arrangement that can escape from any possible schematic 
a description of whatever is the system or you know in mexico it's a, it's very complicated in institutionally and uh, ideologically i would say you maybe coming from there you know but of course i'm i don't identify myself with any of these elements i i don't i i don't really have any relationship with any institution uh, as a I mean, I don't get any payment from any office, but also I don't, I don't, I'm not a militant, and I'm not against. In if, if I need to to express myself that way, I, then I go to a demonstration. That's that's maybe the way, and also if necessary, when joining with other colleagues to sign against something or in favor of something, we do so, but never through my work. Maybe if there are no many more questions, we can just thank you again, Ibrahim. Thank you. Can say something, Robin? Maybe? I saw you raising your hand. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Um, so of course, I'm you know, really intrigued by seeing what you've been doing since we last spoke. Um, you said early on something that I thought would be maybe productive for everyone here to sort of recall and think about, and that is um, you said that you work in a very productive way, but not in a capitalist way. And one of the things that's so interesting about your work is the relationship between use value and exchange value, um, but not, uh, you know, so the way in which an object, uh, you confront an object, um, uh, not thinking about its sale value, but thinking about how it might be used in a certain situation. Okay, so, um, but um, I, what I was um, thinking when you were talking, especially about this last question, about romanticizing, you know, poverty, um, that that's, um, that's not really, uh, I don't think that's what's going on here, in, in large part because that would be a model of resistance uh, politics, and that's not what we've got here. Um, um, a resistance politics is, a, you know, as we all know, um, is, uh, you know, especially um, in Latin America, if you think about the trajectory of Marxism, um, is, uh, has been, you know, is something that was put under an awful lot of pressure and now is um, really needing to be rethought. And one of the things that I think is so fascinating about your work is the way in which it, it does not go that direction, that old, uh, that old model. It's looking for a new, uh, a, a new space, a new model for how to think about our global world. And, um, and so I'm really interested in this sort of deliberate um, precarity, deliberate um, productive, non-productive, um, those kinds of, of, of um, ways of thinking about dyna dynamism and collapse at the same time um, as um, possible ways to rethink the kind of, you know, Protestant Weberian um, work ethic capitalist model that is hegemonic, which is still dominant. Um, and to come up with uh, some other model of how to engage with our contemporary reality that encompasses that um, pr productivity and failure at the same time, um, th that doesn't take that ideal, uh, that uh, Weberian ideal of um, it must be productive, it must go forward, it must be progress in uh, a pure capitalist sense. And so one of the things I'm really fascinated by here is the, the way in which your work offers an opening to think outside that particular model of the modern, of modernity broadly. You know, so modernity not as necessarily only capitalist. Um, modernity is having, a, is, uh, there's a possible other way of thinking modernity. And in particular, I'm thinking of uh, the work of Bolivar Echeverria um, and his concept of Baroque modernity, um, which 
encapsulates this idea of the contingent, the non-productive, as specifically um, a, a mode through which, especially in Latin America, but you know, he takes it more broadly, one can think of other modes of um, conceptualizing modernity. So, um, you know, and I, I think, uh, you know, coming, uh, especially uh, uh, Mexico, Latin America as a whole, because of the long Baroque tradition, um, um, not as a, uh, I'm thinking of it not as a form of identity, but as a mode literally of thinking ma the modern differently, um, of thinking it as simultaneously collapsed and productive contingent and, you know, and I'm, I'm so, you know, I love in it that you're, you know, you, you've got, um, uh, Michael was just thinking about the, the work you showed us in France, the circular work, seems to encapsulate actually such a lot of your production, um, such a lot of your thinking um, through different stages that I've seen. From the beginning of autoconstruction, right in the very center around which all of these different phases and, and interests you've developed in your work with the plants, music, performance, you know, it just seems to be a very rich kind of summation of what, you're, what you've been doing, you know, at least since I met you. Um, but what Robin's saying too, I think the, the idea that use value can become um, exchange value, but it can be turned back into use value. And this is what your work does so beautifully, you know, it, you, a thing is a thing, it becomes something else, but it's a thing, and you can you choose to throw it away, you choose to use it again, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, those things, that kind of dynamism is really wonderful, so this is what you were talking about, but not, not moving forward within that capitalist framework. Thank you, yeah. <laughs> no, well, no, I think, uh, you're right, no, I think it's, uh, it's something very interesting because maybe now that I, I was listening to you, I was thinking, I mean, answering again, like maybe the, the question from, what's your name again, sorry, uh, about like uh, Alberto, that, uh, about the system or being used or using the system. And I, I was uh, thinking that the, maybe the only political force I would identify myself with in a, maybe the, the way you were describing um, when, discuss, when discussing Latin America and the process of Latin America through authoritarianism in the last century at least, uh, after colonialism, uh, I would say it's Zapatista, the Zapatista movement in which, of course, this, this uh, symbolical transformation in which things are things are very, very strong. It's so powerful. These people, he arranged a, 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 an armed revolution, you know, and suddenly it became a cultural enterprise. It is for transforming things into things again, and to just to give dignity to nature and people and and soil, territory, language. Language should be language, and and uh, like a linguist. Mije linguist Yasnaya Aguilar Hill from Oaxaca State, she says, the only territory that is left for us is language. So if we don't use it, we, we should be then in problems. And this is it. That's what I'm trying to do with in, acknowledging and understanding the way I make or produce questions dealing with objects. You know, again, I don't, I don't, I don't go to an object because it's rusty or because it's funny or because it's... Uh, a typical or traditionally made or, or handmade or no, it's because it's material itself. And it, 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 it includes its own questions. And then together they make questions to each other. That's a system. Yes, now it is. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay, good. Thank you again. Thank nice you, Dad. To...